And then we want to tell eight and nine year olds, follow, follow. you got to be good. You can't be a bully. Well, obviously you can, because that makes you the president. Right, that's what young people are learning now. So you could sexually assault, you could call Mexican rapists, you could say a Muslim ban. You can say anything and everything. You could bully your way into the presidency. And then we tell young people, just work hard. Don't be a bully. Be nice. Man, the contradictory messaging going on right now is, is beyond. It is beyond, right? These are all things that, I didn't even read from my speech. <laughs> just... The energy in here is, is, is pretty amazing, so. Um, but look, all that I say can be backed up, you know, with empirical fact, methodology, a lot of research, right? And a lot of lived experiences and people's personal narratives. One of the best pieces of advice I can definitely give you is something that I heard Toni Morrison say a couple years ago, Toni Morrison, the author. She said, I have never written a book for white people and I will never see myself through the white gaze. And I said, you know, I kind of been rolling like that for a while, but the way she put it, can't see yourself through whiteness. Latinx, we can't have a race to that, man. African Americans, your blackness never goes away. And nor should it. When we learn about ourselves as a people, we often learn the history of our oppression. But we don't learn about resistance. I named some groups from the 60s. But we could start with Du Bois and Douglas and Nat Turner. And we could start with Arturo Schomburg and Fannie Lou. And we can talk about Ida B. Wells Barnett. And we could talk about James Baldwin. We could talk about the Black Communist Workers Party. Or we could talk about Negroes with guns, where Negroes had guns down south to protect themselves from white KKK people. We can talk about Du Bois being a communist and leaving the NAACP and dying in exile, basically, or self-imposed exile when he died. We talk about Marcus Garvey. We could talk about, again, Los Machateros and the Young Lords and Filiberto and Asada and Lolita and Dilcia, the Black Panther Party, the Weather Underground, the American Indian Movement. That's our resistance just in this country. The United Farm Workers, Cesar Chavez, Yuri Kochiyama, the Asian left. Why don't they want you to know that part? That's the resistance of our people. That's how we exist. People who were enslaved didn't go vote for freedom, did they? Nah. They fought their way out of freedom and demanded the ballot as a tactic. We now think the ballot is freedom. We clearly now know it's not. We cannot be shaming people who didn't vote. 52% of Americans who could vote didn't vote. And people are like, oh, if you don't vote, then you don't have a voice. Maybe they're seeing something we're not seeing right now. Maybe they peeped the game already and are out that game. But as someone, I ran for Vice President of the United States in 2008. I ran with Cynthia McKinney on the Green Party ticket. Cynthia McKinney, a former Democratic Congresswoman. Cynthia left the Democratic Party over their stance on the war. In 2008, in Chicago, the Green Party nominated us as the first, and to this day, only woman of color ticket in American presidential politics. I'm um, the first Boricua period on the ballot like that. They don't want you to know that. And they don't want you to know that we did it under the Green Party, a party that fights for racial justice, reparations, a party since the 1980s has been talking about canceling student loan debt. That's where Bernie stole all his wonderful ideas from, from the Green Party platform. They don't want you to know. And then you have to ask yourself, in a democracy, why do I have to choose between two? Look at the two horrible choices. 
they, you know, it's fascinating. They even want to talk about the lack of black turnout. That's what cost Hillary the Clinton. The, no, she cost herself the election. Yes, mm-hmm. I just heard Jake Tapper from CNN on an interview yesterday. He said the problem with the Clintons is that they want to do good, but they want to be well off. And do you were you weren't rolling with us ever since you called the super predators? So I'm not even trying to hear that. You you weren't rolling with us then, and you weren't rolling with us when you told your husband that juvenile justice crime bill was one of the best bills he was ever going to sign, and that welfare reform was good. I don't care how many times you had the Children's Defense Fund or at a black church, you were not rolling with us, and you also support deportations and were supporting TPP. You think people did not peep that with stupid? People ain't stupid. So we who voted can't be shaming people who don't. We have to ask the question, if we want the ballot as a tactic to deal with public policy and local issues in our community, then we have to understand why people haven't voted and create something new that they will vote for. That's why I've been with the Green Party. They even trying to blame Jill Stein. Jill Stein got less than 1% of the vote. Hillary Clinton still really won the popular vote. But the Electoral College, which the Green Party has been wanting to get rid of for 30 years and do what we call ranked choice voting, like they do at high schools. Number one's the president, number two's the vice president. When you're running for government in high school, you're not running on a party, right? You're running on your ideas. Because we know with the Electoral College, every vote doesn't count. So the lesson right now is that we also have to say to ourselves as organizers and activists and those that have political consciousness that we have been complicit. We have gone with the lesser of two evils. But what we have to be very clear now is that who is to blame is not people, but is the system of white supremacy, of patriarchy, capitalism, and a corrupt political system. All the world, all over the world does anti-blackness, anti-migrantness, anti-everything. Look at what's going on in Europe. Brexit what's going on in Brussels, what's going on in France, and now that Trump won, you think all of Europe is not about to go to the right except for probably Greece or maybe Spain? What does that mean then for Latin America and dictatorships and authoritarian behavior? What does it mean for the continent of Africa that's being stripped of all its remaining resources from China right now? We have to think beyond the borders. We live in a global society. Resistance is global. We have to play our part. We can't only worry about what Trump's gonna do to us. What's he gonna do to the rest of the world? That's what we have to worry about as well. It is our responsibility. Because right now, we have to say, we have a megalomaniac for president. And I'm sorry for whoever voted for Trump. If you voted for jobs, you voted for racism. You might not know it, but you did. And now you got to deal with it. So I'm not trying to hear when people like, y'all need to calm down. No, we don't need to calm. When do we act up? When the deportation buses are taking our brothers and sisters? When more Muslim women are being brutalized and hijabs? Like, when is enough? Do we... Is it enough or do we march silently? Are we literally gonna march to our own deaths? No, we don't need to shut up. What we need to say now is we do not consent to you. We need to be ungovernable in any way we can make that happen. You don't get a chance when you appoint a white nationalist. We went from a black president that I have political problems with to one that's supported by the KKK. That's where we're at now, right? We have to say we do not consent. We have to be disruptive. We can't be falling into that love Trump's hate. No, it doesn't. I don't have time for platitudes right now, man. They're coming at our people. And again, before he's even inaugurated.
So I'm going to end with the, um, something from Asada Shakur, right? But I, 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 look, I implore all of you, you need to be disruptive. You need to not consent. You need to go in your communities and organize. You need to not consent. You need to go into your communities and be advocates. You do not consent. You don't have to feel guilty for rejecting a racist, xenophobic, misogynistic, patriarchal capitalist who believes that climate change is a hoax. If your children or sisters or brothers or cousins or mothers or uncles are telling you this, this coming Thanksgiving on Thursday, would you not say something back? If I'm with my Latinx brothers and sisters and I hear anti-blackness, am I going to consent? Am I going to be complicit? Am I going to be silent? How many queer people have to be afraid? How many young people have to say they're literally on the brink of committing suicide? We have to say we don't consent. We have to be ungovernable. We have to become ungovernable. And that means that we need rules for survival. We cannot think that institutions will save you. We cannot make compromises. We can't think that a PhD will save you. I'll tell you what saves us, the power of the people. Organizing, knowing your history, resistance. Your faith has to lie in being a revolutionary. Every day, you cannot do something big, but every day you can do something. The struggle is beautiful. You have to join it. This is your time as young people. You're either gonna wake up tomorrow and choose to be on the right side of history, or you're gonna be on the wrong side of history. And 20 and 30 years from now, you're gonna have to have a conversation with a young person about which side you picked. Let it be the right side. Asada says, carry it on now, carry it on. Carry it on now, carry it on. Carry on the tradition. There were black people since the childhood of time who carried it on. In Ghana and Mali and Timbuktu, we carried it on. We hid in the bush when the slave master came, holding spear, and when the moment was right, leaped out and lanced the lifeblood of our would-be masters, we carried it on. On slave ships, hurling ourselves into oceans, slitting the throats of our captors, we took their whips and their ships, blood flowed in the Atlantic and it wasn't all ours, we carried it on. Fed Mizey, our snake apple pie, fed Mizzy, our snake apple pies, stole the axes from the shed, went and chopped off the master's head. We ran, we fought, we organized a railroad. It was called the underground and we carried it on. In newspapers and in meetings, in arguments and street fights, we carried it on. In English and Spanish, we carried it on. In tales told to children, in chants and cantantes, in poems and blues songs, in saxophone screams, we carried it on. In classrooms and churches and courtrooms and prisons, we carried it on. On soapboxes and picket lines, welfare lines, unemployment lines, we carried it on. In sit-ins and prayings and marches and die-ins, we carried it on. On cold Missouri nights, pitting shotguns against lynch mobs. On burning Brooklyn streets, pitting rocks against fire, we carried it on. Against water hoses and bulldogs, nightsticks and bullets, tanks and tear gas, needles and nooses, bombs and birth control, we carried it on. In Selma and San Juan, Mozambique, Mississippi, Brazil, Panama, Cuba and Boston, we carried it on. Through the lies and the sellouts, the mistakes and the madness, through the pain and frustration, we carried it on. Carried on the tradition, carried a strong tradition, carried a proud tradition, carry it on. Pass it down to the children, pass it down, carry it on, carry it on, carry it on now to freedom. Palante siempre palante. Thank you, everybody.
I stayed under 10, 10 so 10, 10 is my time. You're great, bro. You're oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. I didn't want to. But thank you. The energy here, good. I know I dropped some bombs, and it's like not even 10 o'clock. <laughs> so, you know, I was like, what am I going to say? What do you want to speak? Thank you. Tweet me. You can tweet me anything you want. Just don't curse at me because I will block you. <laughs> Beyond that, I'm good. Um, what would you recommend um, as a reading list for young people? That well, the, the, you should read the Kahambi um, River State uh, Collective Statement, Kombahi. Um, uh, collective statement, which was what we call our first wave of black feminists like Bell Hooks and June Jordan and Barbara Smith. Um, you should reach anything around Chicana feminisms from that era as well. You should definitely be reading a blog called the Crunk Feminist Collective. Um, and in fact, the founder, uh, she's a professor, Dr. Brittany Cooper, out here in Jersey at Rutgers in New, in New Brunswick, I think, or maybe Newark. You should read Gender Outlaw by Kate Borenstein. She's a um, white, probably the first, she's white um, in the 50s that began to talk about gender being a norm and how we break from that. There's some racial things that probably she doesn't do well, but in terms of understanding that fluidity. And I would encourage you to really follow like a lot of the sisters in Black Lives Matter. Um, especially because Alicia and Patrice, two founders of BLM, identify as queer women. I would look at BYP 100 um, out of Chicago, but growing chapters all over the country. They do their work specifically through a black, what they call black queer feminist lens theory. Um, that's just some, okay? So it's a network, and, 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 and that's the thing with social media. If you don't know right now, all you gotta do is find a hashtag and start following a network, right? But I do like that you ask for books. <laughs> because we also have to be very, we have to, it's not that we have to be about theory and academic language. Like I get that, I'm writing a PhD. I hate how I have to write the dissertation. But I know that I could speak in Harvard and I could speak to brothers and sisters on the street. And, and the, the same for me that brothers and sisters on the street are saying what I'm saying, they're just using different words, right? Mm -hmm. And we cannot talk about our people like they're not intellectual beings. But for those of us who have the ability to study, we got to read books. I'm sorry about that. That's my husband's phone. Okay, I, have probably, I could probably take a couple. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, that's not our job. <laughs> it's not our job. I'm sorry. Yes. It, it, the burden, why is the burden of us talking about racism it's like always on people of color? You see what I'm saying? What's happening at these protests is that a lot of white folks out there protesting, they want Hillary to be president. While we're out there protesting like, no. <laughs> and Black Lives Matter and deal with that. Right? That's what. That's the problem at a lot of these protests because I've seen the reaction, and it's fascinating. There was a protest in Oakland, and there were white people telling black people to not be so loud. You in Oakland, but of course it's not because you gentrified it, <laughs> and now you're not giving up how we look. As a professor and an educator and organizer, I talk to everybody. I specifically choose to organize in black and only brown spaces. Doesn't mean I'm not in coalition with multiracial groups. But my job as an organizer, a person, is not to be convincing white people that racism exists. And it's not my job to make you feel better. Now, with that said, like an organization like Standing Up for Racial Justice, I think that is the best organization out there right now that works with white people specifically. Very radical thinking, very aware of the system of white supremacy, and very aware that, like, especially at this time, 
People need to stop coming up to us for hugs and shit like that. Like, we're not, no. Like, no, right? And I'm just saying that not as you not to have a conversation, but at some point you might be like, I can't change what you're thinking right now. And then maybe part of our effort should be more about, we still got to deal with our people in our community. Like, it's not like 13%, 13% of black men did vote for Trump. 29% of Latino people did vote for Trump. You see what I'm saying? So I think especially on colleges, that's always an undue burden on students of color. Plus, then you have to be really good at school. It's not fair. So that's what I would say. And if a white person takes it wrong, they might not be the white person you want next to your side when it goes down. Because no white person who's doing the real work of racial justice would ever see that as wrong. I'll tell you that now, because I work with those folks all the time, every day, and they are my comrades. White folks like that, they call themselves anti-imperialists, and they follow black and brown leadership without a problem. And those folks are out there. I'll take two more, because I know we gotta wrap. Go, and then, then there was somebody else. I'll be quick, yes, go ahead. Uh, you talked about a lot of interesting things. You talked about a moral technique and Reagan. Yeah. Now, um, <laughs> after we had this kind of change with the election President Obama, mm -hmm. Yeah. And his demagoguery and his fear mongering. Mm -hmm. And you seem to be a very, uh, you seem to be a contemporary historian, moreover, talking about like literature from the 60s and stuff yeah. like that. I, I, I'm more interested in a lot of classical stuff, Western classical stuff. Yeah. Um, and I think of like Hellenism when I think of the United States after Alexander's empire. Yeah. And the thing that interests me most about Hellenism was that every Hellenic state was dominated by a Greek general's family. Mm -hmm. So they were Persian, Indian, Syrian, Mesopotamian peoples all ruled by Greek rulers. And what happened after Alexander's death is a series of wars that lasted nearly 200 years by the power of their rhetoric. So how dangerous is this, is this tool of our... Rhetoric? Yes. I mean, I think it's, it's, it is very dangerous. That type of rhetoric, demagoguery, xenophobia, racist, yeah, of course. And, I mean, people have been comparing that to that time period that you're talking about. That You know, so I'm not a comparative historian. I do deal with the contemporary, right? Because then a lot of that is through the Western lens. and does not take into account African um, governing, you know, dynasties. It doesn't take into account into indigenous people and how they use more of a people's assembly model of governing. So I think we're also looking at people saying, this is not how we want to be governed, right? There was one more? There was another one? Yes. Um, it's not a question. Okay. I just want to say thank you so much. Thank you. So much. Thank you so much. Oh, it's emotional. <laughs> it's emotional. <laughs> it's all right. Um, I seen you speak back in yeah. April at the American Multicultural Leadership Conference at UW-Madison. Yeah. Um, oh, you were there, yeah. Thank yes. you. Yeah. It was... I seen I seen students revolutionized at that conference. It was terrifying. It was beautiful. But you helped those students feel like they had a voice. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank you because seeing you again, I feel privileged to see you again because I had that privilege back in April to see you and speak upon. They had Trump come to that campus, and the students protested against mm -hmm. it, and the um, chancellor was okay with it. He was like, "Yeah, have Trump come to campus." These students were fighting for what they thought was right, and they, they know is right. Um, but I really just wanted to say, I appreciate you so much. And all the words you say just speak to me in all different ways, and it relates to all the people around me. So thank you for making this a very inclusive environment, because that's what we need right now after these elections. And like to see you after that election, when I know my campus, even though it's a PWI, those students were hurting. I asked students, mm -hmm. what stage of grief are you at right yeah. now? Because that's just how bad it was. So thank you so much. I appreciate you. I want. I wish everyone could hear you just to get a piece of what a piece of pie that you're giving to us. Well, let's just say, and I'll end with this. First of all, thank you. Thank you so much. You know, I have a daughter, she's 11, strong, black, Boricua child. You know, in fact, right now, her school is in a courtroom 
where we're defending three black women at SUNY Albany that were beaten, mm -hmm. and the pros they're not being prosecuted for telling their truth, and they're facing three years in jail, many misdemeanor charges, and my daughter goes to school that luckily goes to protest. <laughs> And she was at the one the other day that was the Water for Life national protest. And look, as someone who didn't grow up with this, I'm telling you, and most people in my family, 95% are, are never going to be organizers or activists. I got some people in my family in Ohio and Nevada that voted for Trump, for real. And I was like, Rosa won't be at any damn wedding or family reunion. <laughs> <laughs> and they're probably like, it's all good. We don't want you there. <laughs> But look, at the end, my loyalty is to the people. And there will be people who will say what I said was divisive, was this, that. No. I'm speaking truth. I'm carrying on the tradition of our ancestors. I will organize and resist till the day I die. And that's how we all have to be. We all have ways that we're gonna do it. Some of us are gonna be visible, some are gonna be underground. Some are gonna be the supporters of the movement and write the checks, and some ones are gonna be on the front lines. Some of you are gonna be the people's lawyers to ensure the environment, to ensure those of us that do protest are out. And some will go a different way, but 